Welcome everyone to today's webinar on Millikan's Compression Training Academy. We will be covering Module 5, Home Care. This is the fifth module of six in the series. Follow-up information will be shared after this webinar on the date and time for the final upcoming module. On behalf of Millikan, thank you for joining us. Before we begin, we will touch on some housekeeping. Today's webinar will begin with the presentation followed by a question and answer session. Questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation by clicking on the dialog bubble icon with Q&A noted and entering in your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available after the event on the Millican Healthcare YouTube page. If at any time the slides stop moving or the audio stops, exit out of the Microsoft Live team event and rejoin. Please submit any technical questions that you have into that same Q&A icon as we are here to help. Millikan & Company is a family-owned U.S.-based organization in business for more than 150 years. With expertise in textiles and chemicals, Millikan's healthcare division was formed with innovative products and technologies focused around improving patient lives together. Millican Healthcare offers a variety of products and technologies, including a compression products range called Coflex TLC. Coflex TLC is offered in two layer compression kits designed to provide optimal compression. These compression systems come in variations based on the activity level of the patient, as well as the desired compression or pressure range. In addition to Coflex TLC compression, Millican Healthcare offers advanced wound care products developed with moisture management in mind. These offerings include Tritec wound contact layer dressings, ultra foam dressings, and agile gelable fiber dressings. With that, I'm pleased to welcome today's speaker, Claire Stevens, Millikan's clinical nurse specialist. Thank you, Claire, for being here today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Welcome to Millikan Healthcare Compression Training Academy, a series of educational modules intended for healthcare professionals caring for patients with venous leg ulcers and complications of the lower limb who require compression therapy. Welcome to module five of the Compression Training Academy, Home Care. This module will focus on the giving of patient information and advice to ensure safety and effective compression care whilst at home. How as healthcare practitioners we can ensure the correct level of home care advice, information and other supportive materials are issued to or are being independently accessed by our patients. This module will cover an introduction to leg ulcers. We will recap the size and cost of the leg ulcer problem globally, which underpins the desire of best outcomes for both the patient and the healthcare provider. Information and support networks. We will explore what information is available, what information is reliable and what should be avoided how we can help direct our patients to the best information sources and support networks to safeguard them on their healing journey. 
Explaining compression to patients. We will look at how to explain compression mechanisms to patients using non-medical jargon and easy to understand approaches to assist the patient to fully understand why their compression therapy is a critical part of their healing journey, not just a bandage which covers their wound. Care advice when wearing compression. We will look at the essential advice criteria to issue to a patient when initiating compression therapy. Seeking assistance, signs and symptom alerts, safety guidance at home. We will explore the signs and red flags a patient should look for and when, how and to whom they should seek assistance between routine clinic appointments. We will explore the importance of general health and limb health during and after compression therapy to maximise healing outcome and prevent further breaches of skin integrity. We will cover patient information relating to skin care essentials, exercise and dietary essentials, caring for the newly healed limb and preventing future leg symptoms and wounds. In preparing this presentation, we have used and relied upon information from public sources on the web. We therefore make no warranty expressed or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the underlying assumptions, estimates, data or other information not generated by Millikan. Compression therapy is considered gold standard treatment for the management of chronic venous insufficiency, venous reflux and associated conditions, including edema, venous leg ulceration and skin conditions such as venous eczema. The goal of compression therapy is to support the underlying venous system and structures, aid venous competence to improve venous return, reduce limb edema, decrease pain and increase leg ulcer healing rate. Compression therapy will be required for life to prevent chronic venous insufficiency and symptoms of venous reflux from recurring. Module one of this education series contains in-depth information on the causes of chronic venous insufficiency, the venous system and its structures, the veins, the valves and the calf muscle pump. Venous leg ulcers are a global healthcare challenge. The United Kingdom estimates prevalence between 0.1 and 0.3%. The United States of America, approximately 1.69%, with similar prevalence rates reported in parts of Europe. The annual cost of managing confirmed venous leg ulcers in the United Kingdom is reported to be between 500 and 900 million pounds. The United States of America estimate annual costs between 2.5 and 3.5 billion dollars and are consistent with European estimates, with Germany reporting cost to treat at between 9,900 and 10,800 euros. These figures continue to be challenged. Erwin et al in 2022 report lower costs in the United Kingdom through continual prevalence and reporting methodologies. The cost to the individual patient and impact on their quality of life is impossible to measure. Recurrence rates are reported to be between 26 and 69% at 12 months post healing. There are a plethora of evidence based policies and guidelines available, which have been designed to establish a global consensus approach toward leg ulcer management and selection of compression therapy, including the International Advisory Panel for Compression, who published a pathway cited in the European Wound Management Association compression documents. Information and support networks. Discourage the use of unregulated internet information. 
In today's climate of easy access to internet materials that are not regulated by healthcare professionals, this source of information has the potential to mislead patients about aspects of their underlying disease and legal some management strategies being deployed. Sometimes patients will also request treatment types seen on the internet or being administered to a family member, friend or colleague who has the same condition. The treatment may be working for them, so of course they desire the same. This can be very challenging to manage with your patient. It is important to explain that every patient's care is individualised to them and equally important to educate your patients and direct them to reliable sources of information and networks to support them on their compression and healing journey. Firstly, we should provide more comprehensive patient information, which covers not only the general care advice for compression and limb, but also includes guidance towards regulated specialist legal for information sources, reliable networks and patient groups. Globally accessible organisations, for example, the International Lymphedema Framework or the Leg Club. The Leg Club movement is a global initiative designed to care for people suffering from or at risk of chronic leg disease within a social model of care. Their movement is composed of three core elements. Core one, the Leg Club Network, a group of leg clubs that operate around the world. Leg clubs are dynamic institutions that work within local communities and are made possible by volunteers, nurses, contributing organisations, and of course the members or the patients. You can explore if this model is present in your country or area, or take steps to initiate this valuable network. Core two, the leg club model, is the way they operate. All leg clubs subscribe to this model and its core principles. Although leg clubs are autonomous and are encouraged to develop their own initiatives, you may be able to initiate a leg club for your patients. Core three, the Lindsay Leg Club Foundation. This is the registered charity core that supports the Leg Club network and promotes the Leg Club model. It is run with an independent board of trustees. The foundation is there to provide any assistance that it can to individual leg clubs, while essentially providing education on leg health and the impact that leg clubs have on their members. These core models offer support for you as healthcare practitioners and for your patients. Patient information. This is an essential aspect to ensure your patient fully understands their disease, diagnosis, correct treatment, and what is normal or not normal, what they need or can do, when and how. Through the provision of well-written patient information, clinicians are able to offer jargon-free, easy to understand advice for their patients, and this should include investigations and results explanation, underlying chronic venous insufficiency or ankle brachial pressure index, the process and the results should be explained in an easy to understand way. Often practitioners relate to plumbing and boilers or roads and roundabouts to explain the blood flow and pressure within the lower limb. And ankle brachial pressure index as taking blood pressure as you would normally in the arm, but also on the leg. We will discuss this further shortly. Their treatment plan is individual to them and treatment is selected to match their ankle brachial pressure index result, limb volume and the wound needs. Explain compression and other treatments that are being used, what they are and how they work. We are going to cover in more depth explaining the following aspects to the patient shortly. How to care for their compression between clinical visits the do's and don'ts, 
Some may have washing and drying instructions and others are single use. What to look out for and when to act or seek support, who to contact or what action to take. Advice on what they can do to maximise their own healing outcome, such as limb elevation, their diet, exercise and general skin care. Caring for fragile, newly healed skin. What they can do following healing to prevent future leg ulceration. Explaining compression to patients, giving easy to understand medical jargon free explanations. Chronic venous insufficiency. Explaining when the blood pressure in the deep veins of the lower leg is higher than it should be. That this affects the pressure and return of blood flow effectively. This can be complex and challenging to explain to our patients. One of the easiest ways to explain this is as being similar to a central heating, plumbing and pump system at home, then relating it back to their lower limb plumbing. The blood flow in their lower limb is supported through their veins, valves and calf muscle pump. So how can we explain these structures, their roles and what can go wrong simply to our patients? Their veins. Describe these as being like the plumbing pipes of a heating system, so the pipes of their lower limb. Ideally, the pressure within these pipes needs to be kept regulated and should not be too high, which can lead to damage of the walls of the pipes. The valves within their veins. Describe these as being like radiator opening and closing valves. Under the correct water pressure within the pipes, the valves will open and close effectively and water, which can be related back to blood, will flow through the pipe and when the valve closes, there will not be any backflow nor leakage within the system. If, however, the water pressure is too high, the valves may become damaged under the additional pressure and be unable to prevent backflow. This is the same for the valves within their veins, managing the blood flow in their lower limb. Their calf muscle pump. This helps to pump and empty the deep pipes and return fluids upwards. This can be described as being like a boiler pumping system. When all three structures of a heating system are working effectively and in harmony, the pressure is regulated, not too high, and water flow within the heating system is problem free. If one structure breaks, this can impact all three structures, and this is the same for their lower limb structures. Deep vein blood pressure. Like the heating system, pressure regulation is of greatest importance and high pressure increases have consequences. If the pressure in the pipes is too high for prolonged periods of time, it can damage the system valves and prevent the pump working effectively. Leakage and failure to deliver fluid back to the central system will occur. This is chronic venous insufficiency. Vein pressure too high, valve damage and calf muscle pump not being able to empty those deep veins. The relationship between chronic venous insufficiency and edema can then be explained as the leakage of fluids into the surrounding tissues due to incompetent plumbing and that eventually the surrounding tissue will break down and a wound will be formed in exactly the same way as a leaking pipe will eventually saturate a wall and the plaster will create a hole at some point in time. This plumbing scenario is very easy for patients to relate to for understanding their own lower limb blood pressure increases and the impact on their whole venous system. They will also later more easily understand how their compression therapy is supporting these structures and reversing the symptoms of chronic venous insufficiency. We also need to explain how we obtain their blood pressure in the lower limb. If we explain that it is non-invasive, quick and pain-free, the blood pressure will be taken in the leg in the same way as we routinely measure blood pressure in the arm with the same type of blood pressure cuff 
and perhaps a handheld probe to listen to their foot pulses or with newer ABPI measurement machines where four cuffs are placed on each extremity. A calculation is made from the blood pressure readings and this gives a number which lets the healthcare practitioner determine how much compression treatment can be used safely and effectively, so how much squeeze is required to support their veins, valves and calf muscle pump to reverse their symptoms and heal their wound. Explaining compression to patients. Understanding the signs and symptoms is important during treatment and post healing for the prevention of recurrence. Always offering easy to understand medical jargon free explanations. Now that we have explained the blood pressure in their lower limb, we can start to match symptoms. Tired, aching legs. Most patients will recall starting to feel aching or tired legs. This is one of the early signs that there is a problem and a sign that patients should be alerted to recognise and act upon for future prevention of recurrence of symptoms and wounds. New varicose veins. Ensure your patient is aware to look for new varicose veins and access help if new ones appear. Explain that these appear due to the blood pressure in the deep veins or the pipes being too high and over time the wall of the vein has weakened or blown like a balloon overfilled with water. New varicose veins are a sign of new or higher pressure increases which require support. Swelling. Lower limb swelling appears when fluids are not effectively emptied from the lower limb. It is important to seek help in the early stages of swelling to prevent further symptoms from developing. Early stage edema can be more easily reversed than edema that has become established within the tissues. It is important for our patients to monitor and respond to any limb swelling and this should happen for life. Skin changes. Explain the skin colour, texture, sensation changes that the patient should look out for. Especially important observations in prevention of recurrence of leg wounds. Leg ulcers. Ideally, by recognising and acting quickly on the previously mentioned symptoms, our patients will be best equipped to prevent future leg ulcers from occurring. Explaining compression to patients, giving your patient an understanding of how compression works. We need to explain why compression bandages, garments or devices have been prescribed for our patient, what the compression's role is in their healing and recovery journey, and that it is normal for the type of compression to change throughout this journey. The key message being the importance of the compression and it being fundamental to their recovery. Offer the patient an anticipated duration of compression treatment and understanding that there are factors which may lengthen this treatment phase, such as the duration of the current wound and underlying chronic venous insufficiency and of course other medical conditions such as diabetes and inflammatory immune disorders. Discuss the number of layers. Some patients may have heard horror stories of bulky and soap bandages which unwind and smell from people who have experienced compression in previous decades. It is important to inform our patients that compression has come a long way and a majority of effective bandage systems are now two layers. They are lightweight, breathable, not restrictive and have been designed with the patient's quality of life at their heart. Explain that we will prescribe the correct level of compression and the best mode of delivery for them as an individual. We are going to explore different modes of delivery shortly. Explain how applied compression will support their venous blood to return to the heart and by doing so relieve the symptoms they are currently experiencing. 
The compression will form a supportive sleeve around their lower limb, which in turn will support their veins, valves and calf muscle pump through reducing blood pressure in the veins, assisting the emptying and upward flow, reducing swelling, managing current swelling and preventing future fluid leakage into the tissues, preventing valve backflow, the external squeeze from the compression reduces the pressure and strain on the valves, supporting the calf muscle pump. The compression acts as a semi-rigid wall for the calf muscle to work against or work with to maximise the pressure exerted to empty the deep veins and drive venous return. Helps to reduce pain. Some patients' limbs are extremely painful due to the level of edema and inflammation of the tissues or even infected wounds. Some patients resist compression therapy through the fear of increased pain. It is important to have the discussion regarding the effects of compression, relieving the swelling and the inflammation and reversing the symptoms that are creating their painful experience. Some practitioners will firstly offer light compression and step up to full compression as a second line once the patient can tolerate. Any wound infection should be managed with antimicrobials first line or if well established systemic antibiotics. A discussion around analgesia is also very important. It is worth asking the patient to take analgesia prior to their clinical visits to ensure their dressing change and compression application is as pain free as possible. Helps healing of any wounds. The key message regarding the compression component of their treatment is that it is a significant contributor to the healing of their wounds and without compression their wounds will never heal or even get worse. Explaining compression to patients, helping your patient to understand different types of compression. Inform your patient that there are many different types of compression available and they will be prescribed different types throughout their healing journey and beyond. Reinforcing the message that compression therapy is for life to prevent recurrence and the best thing that they can do for themselves is to wear some form of compression for life. Types of compression. Compression stockings. Compression stockings are routinely prescribed to patients to be worn when their compression bandage phase is complete. This is usually a couple of weeks post healing and this is the compression for life bit, maintaining the newly healed limb and preventing future chronic venous insufficiency symptoms. There are Velcro devices which can be prescribed for certain patients, again not all. These are often used as a next step following an initial intensive bandaging phase. Dynamic devices. Some patients may be offered the use of dynamic compression devices, particularly those who are working in roles where compression bandages would be hazardous or they are unable to make clinical visits as frequently as required. The device affords convenient treatment schedules where the compression is used. This is also reliant upon the patient using the device as prescribed. Compression bandages. These are considered gold standard and usually first line treatment. There are many different types available and the practitioner will select the best one to meet the clinical and individual patient needs. Advice when wearing compression helping your patient to maximise their recovery. It's important to inform your patient about anticipated frequency of compression change and why frequency may change from time to time as they go through their healing journey. For example, in the first two weeks of compression, change may be higher, two to three times a week whilst the swelling subsides and then change may be reduced to once or twice weekly. Also, if an episode of wound infection occurs, frequency of change may increase until the wound infection is resolved. 
Potential dressing and bandage leaking during an episode of infection may warrant a full dressing and frequency of change review. There are also some bandages and devices which require daily applications. General care. It's important that the patient knows to keep the compression dry, not to roll the compression at the top or the toe area as they will create high pressure spot and potential for skin damage. Or not to put anything down the bandage or garment to scratch any itchy skin, such as a knitting needle, as this will create more wounds, they must report itching and discomfort to practitioners, so solutions to these can be found. The patient should be encouraged to exercise their foot and leg and not to stand for long periods of time, but also to walk frequently. This is to maximise the effectiveness of the squeeze and release of the compression against their limb to help empty their deep veins. Patients should also be asked to elevate their limb whenever possible. The higher the leg, the lower the blood pressure will be in their veins. The use of pillows and footstools is also recommended. The patient should not remove their own compression bandages between clinical visits, as this will delay their healing. This is unless a red flag alert is identified, which we will explore shortly. Compression stockings, garments, devices can be removed to perform hygiene and skin care, but they must be replaced immediately. Signs and symptom alerts, advising patients on what actions they can take. Inform your patient of the critically important signs and symptoms to look for when wearing compression therapy. Highlight red flag alerts. We will look at all of these more closely shortly. Patients require advice on immediate action to be taken, such as compression removal. The importance of and when to seek professional or emergency assistance needs to be explicitly advised. Ensure all emergency contacts and preferred emergency locations to attend are detailed in the patient information leaflet or document issued to the patient when compression therapy is initiated. For more general wound fluid leakage or mild to moderate bandage slippage, the patient needs to know how to contact the nurse to arrange a reapplication. Dressing leakage, increased odour and localised pain can be a sign of wound infection. So patients should be aware of this and advised to contact their nurse for reassessment of the wound and limb. Localised wound infection will be managed with antimicrobial dressings or antibiotics if necessary and increased frequency of dressing change and reassessment schedule will be formulated. For more severe symptoms, including redness and pain potentially associated with cellulitis, red flag action should be followed. We will cover these next. Red flag alerts, patient immediate actions advice. Red flag alerts, the patient must be aware of. They are required to remove their compression immediately and seek immediate medical advice and assistance. They should be detailed fully in their patient information leaflet or document and have easy to follow procedures. Red flags include increased shortness of breath, tingling sensation or pins and needles in the toes, numbness or loss of sensation, toes colour change which is continuous, they may be bluish, pale or white, pain type changes and level increases in the leg, foot or toes, excessive swelling in the toes, foot or above the compression, excessive itching or burning irritation and sensation excessive slippage of the compression. Skin care essentials, helping your patient maintain good skin health. Maintaining good skin health is critical and patients should be made aware of the following. 
Good leg hygiene practice is critical to improve in healing and prevent further complications. Unfortunately, some patients are told not to wash their limbs and the consequences are very poor skin condition and recurrent infection. Ensure that your patient knows that leg washing is a definite yes. The leg should always be washed and dried thoroughly, especially between the toes to prevent any fungal or yeast type infections. Plenty of moisturisation should be applied to maintain skin suppleness and prevent dry, itchy skin conditions. If persistent, paste type bandages can also be used to address the skin conditions, either zinc or calamine. Observe for any type of skin changes, as well as the signs of dryness, any skin irritation or early signs of eczema flare up. Patients should know to report these to their practitioner. We will be looking at eczema in more depth next. Skin care essentials, helping your patient to recognise and seek help for eczema flare ups. Given 20% of people over the age of 70 will develop varicose eczema and 10% of people with varicose veins go on to develop venous skin changes, these stats published by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in 2020. It is therefore one of the largest skin care challenges for the leg ulcer patient and warrants a skin care discussion. Eczema in our leg ulcer patients is often not correctly recognised, not recognised soon enough or misdiagnosed, leading to further areas of skin breakdown and enlargement of existing wounds. It is important to inform our patients to report any new itchy skin episodes, any dry red patches to their nurse as soon as possible. We need to stress to the patient the importance of new itch development and that we wish to avoid any itch scratch and skin breakdown cycle. Advise the patient that once eczema has been recognised and diagnosed, that there are treatment options and that this can be managed. For a severe eczema flare up, a steroid ointment may be required. This is usually required short term for severe flare ups and commonly step down at two week intervals. Patients being managed in home care or community settings having their wounds or compression being done by several different nursing teams often are the ones to remind the teams how long they have received a certain topical steroid and can be a precursor to remind them to step down the treatment and when to step away. Paste bandages may also be introduced to soothe their irritation and relieve their itch cycle. Zinc or calamine can be used. It is important to let the patient know that it may not be eczema and other skin conditions such as contact dermatitis can result from time to time due to the use of many creams, ointments and dressings. The leg ulcer patient can be a highly sensitive group. Again, a paste bandage may be introduced to relieve their symptoms. Also, antihistamines and hydrocortisones in severe cases. A full review of all previous treatments and dressing regimes will be undertaken to assess the possible cause of any dermatitis. Encouraging your patient to exercise their limb to maximise the therapeutic effect of the compression and strengthen their calf muscle. We need to give information which includes advice on taking regular leg exercises to keep their calf and foot muscles working. We also need to give them recommended exercise techniques. For example, to raise their leg and rotate their foot in a circular motion, then point their toes up and down in a wave motion, as we can see in the image on the slide. The patient information should also include advice to avoid sitting in a chair for a long time, especially with their legs dependent. We have explored elevation of limbs when sitting, but also to advise the patient to stand up regularly and take steps, even just a few steps initially and then build up their mobility. 
They need to avoid standing still for a long time. They should gently and slowly move on the spot, raising each limb slightly to create a walking on the spot rather than standing still technique. If and when the patient is able to mobilise safely, we encourage them to walk as much as possible and increase the frequency and distance as able to do so. They need to wear suitable footwear, which is not too tight over the bandages to create pressure and potential skin damage, equally to not be too loose that their foot risks sliding out of the shoe and increases their risk of fall injury. They need to avoid exercises which risk knocking their leg, potentially causing additional injury, additional wounds or even disrupting the healing that is currently underway. They need to take their painkillers before exercising so they can maximise their exercise and enjoy the experience rather than suffer and feel it is an endurance. We want these to be positive experiences and goals for our patients. The importance of taking a healthy balanced diet. The giving of general dietary and lifestyle advice to patients to aid their wound healing journey. Healthy eating is as critical for wound healing as stopping smoking. We advise our patients to address both. If a patient is struggling to stop smoking, we should be assisting them and directing them towards smoking cessation services available in their locality. We will also offer advice on weight and diet. We ask our patients to weigh themselves regularly and aim for their ideal weight as agreed with the practitioner. This may have to be in a series of small goals and steps to achieve an overall larger goal. Patients should also be informed to let their practitioner know of any sudden increases or decreases in their weight. Too much weight loss is as important and additional food supplementation may be required. Ensure the patient is aware that their increased weight will put additional pressure on the leg veins. So by reducing their weight, they are supporting their own venous return. We can make the patient aware that we can support further by involving a dietitian if necessary. We advise the patient to take extra protein, which is required for the repair of their wound tissues. We advise them to eat meat, fish, eggs, cheese, milk, nuts or pulses. We also advise the patient to take vitamins and minerals, which are also essential for their cellular functions and renewal. We advise to eat plenty of fresh fruit and vegetables. Advising patients about caring for their newly healed limb. Ensure that your patient is aware of the following. That newly healed wounds are very fragile. They can take several months, sometimes years to mature and strengthen, so may require additional protection. Initially, some patients have a protective dressing to wear beneath their compression stocking and they avoid any trauma to the newly healed area that they need to have caution when applying their compression garments. Themselves, their relative or carer, will be shown how to apply their compression stockings correctly. They may be issued with or able to purchase a device to assist with easy and safe application. It is important that the stocking is applied smoothly and does not cause any trauma to the newly healed area during application. We need to be aware of fingernail trauma on application. They need to moisturise their limb regularly to keep suppleness in the skin and prevent breakage. They need to look after their new scar tissue and moisturise it and gently massage. It's good practice to observe their leg regularly and thoroughly when washing and moisturising. And if they do notice any changes, they are to report them as soon as possible to their practitioner. Helping your patient to prevent future chronic venous insufficiency symptoms and wounds. 
a key point summary your patient should follow for a healthy future. Compression needs to be worn for life. This is to prevent leg blood pressure increases, chronic venous insufficiency symptoms and wound recurrence. That their compression garments, stockings, socks or wraps should always be worn during the day and taken off at night and reapplied in the morning. Compression garments, stockings, socks or wraps should be replaced every four to six months. This timeline can differ from country to country. That they will be invited for a lower limb blood pressure check or an ankle brachial pressure index, usually on a yearly basis. Again, this differs from country to country. That the patient should maintain their good skincare practice and maintain their healthy diet regime. That they continue with their exercises, if possible not to smoke, consume safe alcohol and where possible to refrain from other recreational activities such as substance use. To observe their limbs daily. This can be done during washing and moisturising and if they do notice any changes, they should inform their medical practitioner not to wait for any symptoms to appear or worsen to avoid developing new symptoms and wounds. Thank you for completing Module 5 Home Care of the Millican Healthcare Compression Training Academy. There are five additional modules in the Compression Academy series. Module 1, Leg Ulcers and Conditions Affecting the Lower Limb. This explores lower limb physiology, assessment, investigation and venous leg ulcer differential diagnosis. Module 2, Understanding Compression Therapy, explores how compression works, the theory and science of compression, compression types, characteristics of ideal compression, selection of compression and patient benefits. Module 3, Compression Therapy in Practice, explores and compares various bandage materials, application methods, ease of use, ease of training, patient safety and competency, how to correctly apply, how to achieve and sustain desired levels of compression. This module includes compression, frequently asked questions and a training competency framework example. Module four, wound management principles with compression therapy, explores best practice skincare, wound care, exudate management, infection management and prevention strategies combined with compression therapy. Module six provides clinical evidence summaries to support your compression practice and how to set up and run a clinical evaluation with data template example. Thank you, Claire, for another great presentation. Attendees, we will now begin today's question and answer session. Millikan's clinical nurse specialists Gwen McComey and Susan DeBack are here with us to answer your questions. We have about 14 minutes remaining with this live event. You can submit any questions you have by clicking the Q&A dialog bubble icon within the Microsoft Teams console and type them in. All right, Gwen and Susan, looks like we've got a few questions that are coming through. In simple terms, and Gwen, I will pitch this to you. In simple terms, how do you explain to your home health patient how compression treatment works? Thank you, Naomi. It is very important, <clears throat> excuse me, to keep it simple for patient understanding and compliance. I would tell them that compression treatment will reduce the blood pressure in their lower limb, which will assist in decreasing the swelling. By, by uh, decreasing the swelling, the pain will also decrease and the wounds will also get smaller. Then I would tell them that once wounds are healed, compression therapy will assist in preventing reoccurrence. Thank you, Gwen. Susan, I've got a question for you coming through. How can we educate our home health patients to maximize their healing outcomes? 
Well, Naomi, as Claire stated in the webinar, um, the most important factors for patients to consider are probably diet, exercise, and general skin care. Um, you should really educate your patients on a high protein, low sodium diet, as Claire um, spoke about, um, for wound healing and then edema control. Um, for exercise, even simple leg lifts while lying down are beneficial, as well as trying to walk every hour. I try to tell patients to kind of just, you know, set a timer even. Um, just simple things, just being aware of activating that calf muscle pump. For skin care, as Claire said, make sure you clean the skin thoroughly. Um, really get between those toes and moisturize, moisturize to prevent or alleviate any dry skin. Thank you, Susan. Gwen, I've got a question that I'll bounce over to you coming through. What are red flags for patients to immediately call their home health clinician and to remove their entire compression wrap? Yeah, this is a very important question and it is extremely important for patients to understand these red flags. If they experience any increased shortness of breath, any tingling sensation or pins and needles in toes, numbness or loss of sensation, color changes in their toes, which is continuous, and for example, bluish, pale, or white changes, changes in pain in the toes, foot, leg, uh, excessive swelling in their lower limbs and above the compression wrap, and any kind of itching, burning sensation and excess slippage in the wrap. Very important to call to remove the dressing and to call your uh, home health clinician immediately. Thank you, Gwen. Susan, I've got another question to bounce over to you. What are some different types of compression products? Oh boy, there are quite a few as mentioned in the webinar. Um, let's see, there's multi-layer, there's short and long stretch, light and standard, disposable and reusable, there's stockings, compression devices, and then intermittent pneumatic compression devices. There are a lot of choices, so it's really important to just have the patients have the correct compression for increased compliance and effectiveness. And just remember, um, as Claire stated, chronic venous insufficiency cannot be cured but it can be managed by these products. And compression therapy is the gold standard for edema control and to prevent re reoccurrence. Thank you very much, Susan. And if anyone else has further questions, please utilize the Q&A dialog bubble. That's at the top of the Microsoft Teams console. We're here to answer your questions. We have a few more minutes remaining in the live webinar, so please feel free to pass them through. We will also be sending up a follow-up email regarding information to sign up for the final of the sixth module and series for this Compression Training Academy, along with some contact information that is also captured on this slide. In case any of you attendees come up with any questions, thoughts, or concerns that you have, please utilize those links that are provided. So it looks like we don't have any new questions coming through. So I'll begin to do the wrap up. I will thank Claire for another information packed presentation today and thank we Gwen and Susan for the helpful insights on today's question and answer session. Like I mentioned before, a follow up email will be sent out containing information regarding the final upcoming module. Again, this recording will be available on the Millican Healthcare YouTube page. And thank you all very much for joining us and we hope that you have a great day.